Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're catching this episode near the time of release, I wanted to mention two upcoming events that I'm excited about. First, I will be speaking in the Cannabis Breakout Sessions at BioControls USA Conference in Portland, Oregon, March 4th through 6th, along with Suzanne Wainwright-Evans and Justin McGill two of my former guests on the podcast and good friends of mine. You can sign up on the website at www.biocontrolsusa.com. The other event I want to mention is the Cultivation Classic, also in Portland, Oregon. It's a great event for those interested in organic cannabis cultivation, and I'm looking forward to attending and supporting it again this year. Please check it out at cultivationclassic.cc. My guest this week is Paul Coxon. Paul has been working with plants since 2008. His love for plants was a lifelong passion that developed and grew through the Nebraska Master Gardener program and through his involvement with Hubner's Nursery. Paul received his Bachelor's of Science from NC State, during which time he published five journal articles, received the International Society for Horticulture Society for Horticulture Science Young Minds Award, say that 10 times fast, uh, published over 20 extension and outreach publications, and published three ebooks. Paul has a passion for scientific investigation with the end goal of providing growers and producers with applicable and impactful production knowledge and practices. Paul is currently pursuing his Master's of Science in Horticulture at NC State under the direction of Dr. Brian E. Whipker. Hey, Paul, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. Yeah, let's go ahead and start off giving listeners a little bit of your background and how you came into this role that you have at the university. Yeah, for sure. So um, I have always been interested in plants Um, ever since I was a kid. They were a passion of mine. And that passion just kind of grew and evolved over my life. I was involved in the Master Gardener program, uh, went to numerous extension events, and uh, just through kind of a roundabout way, ended up at North Carolina State University. um, And I actually got my bachelor's here um, and started working with plants under Dr. Brian Whipker, um, doing floriculture work with him and uh, continued working with him through my bachelor's and uh, the opportunity came for me to sign on with a master's uh, for him. And I'm currently a year into that. And it's been one wild ride and never expected to be doing work with cannabis, but here we are. Yeah. You told me a little bit about that off air, how you guys applied for a license and were able to get one and have started doing some research with cannabis or more specifically hemp. Uh, Do you want to talk a little about uh, some of the papers that you've, there's some of the research that's happened at your university? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the way that we got involved in cannabis um, is kind of a roundabout uh, story. Uh, Dr. Whipker and I were just kind of talking one day in the greenhouse, just, you know, shooting the breeze. And uh, I joked with him and said, you know, hey, let's, you know, work in hemp because hemp had just become legalized in our state. You know, he kind of laughed at it. And then a few months later, he contacted me. He's like, hey, I've just applied for a license. We're going to be doing work with hemp. And, uh, you know, ever since then, it's been just one crazy research project after another. And it's opened a lot of amazing doors for us. So we're really glad that we got into it. Um, but as far as some of the work that we've done, um, we got into cannabis. And, uh, you know, normally when you are looking at researching a new area, you know, you jump on. And you'll do a literature review and look at, you know, published literature. And, you know, I got on and jumped on Google Scholar and typed in, you know, cannabis sativa. And I think I used the all in title function and I got 12 results. And uh, it was then that I knew that we were in for one wild ride. Um, So we basically had to start at the foundation. Um, as far as research goes, because, you know, we wanted to establish some baselines for nutrients, for lighting, for growing, uh, pH work, et cetera. Um, 
so that's that's kind of how we got started. Um, I can go more into the specific projects that we've done if you'd like. Yeah, let's do it. Why don't you tell us about your first foray into uh, into cannabis research? And just for listeners to let them know, I do have one of your papers in front of me, the characterization of nutrient disorders of cannabis sativa. So we'll probably spend a little more time on that. I'm going to be kind of flying blind on questions as I don't have the access to the other papers at this time. But uh, yeah, if you want to kind of describe some of the research that you've done and what some of your findings were, I'd love to kind of uh, go through that in a little more detail. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the first things that we did um, was look uh, starting from the ground up, basically, or uh, the soil up. Um, the two first projects that we started doing, um, we were looking at um, optimal rooting um, through clonal cuttings um, because we realized quickly that um, sourcing through seed was just not the way to go. Um, so we started clonally propagating everything. Um, but we were experiencing a huge um, variety of uh, rooting habits and successes when trying to clone um, root cannabis clonally. And uh, in the floriculture industry, we've had a long time to kind of standardize things. So that variability that we're seeing really intrigued us. So one of the first two studies we did, um, we did a rooting study and that has been published. Um, we looked at the use of bottom heat and also the diameter of the cutting, the caliper, um, looking at how those two factors would impact rooting bigger and rooting success. Um, and then the next uh, piece of work that we did was looking at um, optimal substrate pHs, um, and that was in tandem with another lab here at NC State um, doing work there, um, the substrates lab. So those were the kind of the foundation that we did, um, and then from there we kind of went into uh, the nutrient deficiency work that you have in front of you, um, trying to characterize nutrients and nutrient deficiencies, and then we've also had another study published where um, we went into uh, lighting and photo period a bit, um, looking at daylight extension lighting regimes versus night interruption lighting regimes. And uh, I guess I should back up. The very first study that we did was a baseline hemp nutrients leaf tissue survey because we had no idea what optimal nutrients were. So we traveled around the state to different growers operations and we took samples off of their plants and sent them into the lab um, here, um, NCDA, and uh, got some uh, values back and established a baseline. And that work has also been published. Well, I kind of want to talk about the findings from each of these because I think they're all really interesting. But let's start with what you were just describing there in kind of just surveying and establishing um, sort of ranges for cannabis. Uh, using tissue uh, tissue analysis, uh, what can you talk about the sort of the methodology of that and that process and how you determined um, what a healthy plant looked like in terms of those ranges? Yeah, so this was kind of the uh, the dirty mucky science that uh, very few scientists will actually want to reveal. Um, it's very foundational work. Uh, most of the time, when you're dealing with a new crop. Um, or a new discovered crop, it's kind of a shotgun approach. So one of the reasons that we went through multiple different locations um, to try and find healthy plants is because, you know, fertilizer types were different and growing conditions were different. And, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, management strategies were different. The irrigation was different. And that, that introduced a lot of variability. So we were trying to homogenize the landscape by taking a general survey. And uh, that is not to be used as kind of like the golden rule of, you know, this is what adequate leaf tissue parts per million uh, looks like. Um, the survey was just meant to be more of an informational guideline to growers um, saying that, you know, these plants which appeared healthy and were grown vigorously had adequate nutrient ranges. And from what we can infer from other crops, they appear to be within the healthy range. And uh, that work then kind of springboarded into the nutrient disorders work, which is getting closer to establishing fertility guidelines for cannabis. 
Got it. So you, what you're essentially what you're saying is you don't want people to draw too many conclusions from your preliminary work there or that paper other than uh, to see that there may be a possible range here of, of tissue of elements in the tissue that may be allow you to grow what appears to be a healthy plant. Correct. Yeah. So science is a very additive process and the more and more experiments you do in a specific research direction or research question, they begin to add together to form the whole picture. And from that, then you can start inferring and making guidelines. So we're getting close with some of the work that we've done. Um, but it's like, like I said, cannabis is still very new for research. And so we're still just, you know, beginning to gain, gain traction uh, with the research. I think that's a really good point um, that you're making there so that people will consider how, you know, how this may point them in, in sort of a, a direction of a trend, but there's still so much research that needs to be done. I mean, if you were talking about, a, you know, an established crop like corn, you'd find thousands of papers just on nitrogen <laughs> that could discuss this and, and a lot of tissue work that's been done across a variety of different scenarios and environments uh, to where you, you can start really drawing uh, strong correlations, but we just don't have any of that work. So uh, it's, it's still very preliminary, like, like you mentioned. Um, exactly. Yes. I did want to, you mentioned propagation. Mm -hmm. I, I did have, uh, Dr. Kaplan, Darren Kaplan on from oh, the University nice. of Guelph. He did work with, uh, Dr. Zhang mm -hmm. on, uh, propagation already. Now, I don't know, did your work come before or after their paper, which was released, um, in, I think May of 2018. And is there any correlation there or any, anything that you found that sort of fit or didn't fit with the work that they did? Yes. So um, Kaplan's work came before ours. Um, ours was just published at the end of, I believe it was 2018, um, is when ours came out. So his work came before ours. Um, and as far as the, the correlations between the two works, there were some similarities. Um, but for the most part, we were also exploring slightly different things. Um, you know, for example, he used rooting hormones in his work. Um, and we did not look at rooting hormones. We were looking more at the caliper and uh, bottom heat. So when you say caliper, just for people who may not be familiar with the term, you're talking about the uh, a measurement of the diameter of the stem. Correct. Um, and uh, when when you say, uh, sorry, so you, you were measuring you're measuring the caliper in terms of the rooting success of that particular cutting. Is that correct? Yeah, so basically, um, when tr in floriculture, um, when you're trying to establish a more vigorous cutting, um, a, a vegetative cutting, um, you'll apply heat to the bottom of the tray or bottom of the bench or close to the bottom, and that increases the temperature of the substrate. And what that does is it helps uh, speed up the rooting process um, in some species. In others, it will uh, have little to no effect. So we were trying to explore that. And then the other area that we were exploring is the caliper, which when you take a tip cutting from a mother stock plant and you kind of take the tip portion and you point it away from yourself and you look at the end that you cut it, and then you were to measure the diameter of that, that would be the caliper. And the theory was that a thicker caliper could potentially have more surface area for the callus to increase root proliferation and a thicker caliper could also potentially have more reserves, so more photosynthates, et cetera, um, that the plant could draw on to help with the healing and rooting process was kind of the line of thinking that we went down. And did your research support your hypothesis? Yeah, so what we found that it was that um, we divided calipers into three different uh, sizes, small, uh, medium, and large, as far as the caliper was concerned. And we did find that there was a statistically significant difference in rooting between the, um, the small caliper and the large caliper, but not between the small and the medium or the medium and the large caliper. 
And so what that means is that when we actually looked at the date of rooting, the vigor of rooting, um, and we actually then screened the rootings through a visual scale, that the larger caliper produced more vigorous roots um, rather than when compared to the small caliper. And when you say large, I assume you're still talking about fairly uh, immature vegetative plants. I, I do know that cannabis can develop a woodier stem over time, which can it appears to inhibit uh, cloning or propagation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your uh, how you established your experiment and, and what, what you really were comparing there? Yeah, so to answer your question, um, how we kind of went along uh, the lines of exploring how to quantify the uh, size of the cutting or the caliper. We actually went in to mother stock plants. Um, we took um, some mother stock plants and we took uh, vegetative cuttings off of those. And the paper goes into a little more detail on how we quantified that. Um, I won't bore you with the details here, but we divided all of the cuttings, kind of did a survey and looked at the different calipers and the different caliper pools. And from that, we came up with um, the sizes that we used for our study. And uh, the small size was uh, 1.7 to 2 millimeters. Medium size was 2.3 to 2.6 millimeters. And the large caliper was 2.9 to 3.2 millimeters. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the general process of how we approached um, categorizing what a typical caliper would be on our mother stock plants that we uh, were managing and then how we divided them up for the study. Now, did you look at where on the plant itself that the cutting was taken from in terms of from near the top of the plant, uh, near the base of the plant? Um, was that something that was factored in at all in this particular study? Yeah, so we only took from secondary, tertiary, and quaternary branches. Um, and basically what that means is you have the central um, stock from which all the other branches come off. So that's considered the primary. And so any branch that comes off of that would be secondary. Any consecutive branch that comes off of that would be tertiary, so on and so forth. Um, and like I said, the paper, which is um, freely available through Murray State University, the Journal of Agriculture, Agricultural Hemp Research, um, has a wonderful diagram in there on how we actually took the cuttings and um, quantified the branches. But as far as looking at, say, an interior canopy cutting versus an exterior canopy cutting, we were only taking um, shoot tips from the exterior portion of the canopy. And what I mean by a shoot tip is only the terminal growing portion of a cutting. So it terminated in a growing tip. That makes sense. Yeah. So you weren't, you weren't taking more than one cutting off of that, uh, that branch. So in theory, you could go down another few inches and take another cutting. Uh, but you didn't do that for this experiment. I get, I get what you're saying. Uh, were there any other findings from this particular study that you wanted to share besides uh, what you just shared regarding caliper, larger caliper rooting better than smaller caliper? Um, yes. So, um, like I said, that there was a statistically significant difference between the small caliper and the large caliper. Um, and as far as the, um, percentage of cuttings that had rooted at 14 days versus 28 days, um, there was a statistical difference in this study between adding root zone heating or bottom heating versus not utilizing bottom, uh, bottom heating. So that was another interesting portion, uh, interesting finding from the study, rather. What was your control temperature, and then what did you raise it to with the, the root zone two with the bottom heating, and how statistically significant are we talking um, across adding that heat mat or, or heat source? Yeah, so the, um, what we did is we measured the substrate temperature. So the substrate temperature was 27.8 degrees centigrade without root zone heating. Um, and then it was, uh, sorry, that was with root zone heating. 
and the average temperature was 25.6 degrees centigrade without. So we increased the root zone temperature by roughly two degrees centigrade. Okay, just to save all of us Americans who are terrible at Celsius, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this calculation for people. So 28.7 Celsius is 83.66 degrees Fahrenheit. That was your heated temperature. What was your, um, sorry, what was the control again? Yes, um, sorry, that's 27.8 degrees centigrade for the treatment. Oh, okay. So the treatment was 27 points. So 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Correct. And then, and then for the control, it was 25.6 degrees centigrade. Or 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Correct. Okay, so not a dramatic rise in uh, temperature, but you still found statistically significant, statistically significant better rooting. Correct. That's actually yes. surprising to me that I would that just that few of a, a degrees could raise your uh, rooting success that that much. That's really interesting. Yeah. So um, when when doing a study like this, you don't want to raise the temperature, the root zone temperature, too much because you don't want to potentially desiccate or damage um, any roots that are forming or even the callus as it forms. Um, so that's why the temperature differential wasn't overly large. Yeah, I, I, I would have thought that maybe the control temperature might have been lower um, rather than the heated temperature be higher. <laughs> but that, no, that's great. Yeah, we uh, this experiment was uh, conducted during the summer. So we were um, in a poly house. And the cooling coefficient on a poly house is um, much less. So that's why the temperatures were a little higher for the control. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, uh, great. So let's move on to another one of the uh, papers that you mentioned prior to, you know, prior to talking about this uh, nutrient disorder paper. Okay. Are you, um, the substrate pH work, the other one that we did kind of on that ground up approach, um, we're still in the process of publishing that paper. So that one has not been released yet, but oh, those okay. results will be forthcoming. Okay. <laughs> I understand. So maybe we do dive right into the, uh, nutrient, uh, nutrient disorder paper that you wrote or co-authored. That'd be fantastic. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things you talked about with this paper was that you guys really are a team there at the university. Uh, is there any anything you want to mention prior to starting talking about, or did you want to kind of, as we go through the paper, mention the people that were involved in different aspects of uh, this work? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so in our lab, um, we have been really blessed to have a group of fantastic researchers and collaborators that uh, we've worked with on all of these projects, both the projects that we have completed, have published, and are doing. Um, so yeah, uh, Gabby Brahas, Patrick Vizi, David Logan, Matthew Davis, Kimberly McAllister, um, our collaborator, Dr. Michelle Schroeder-Moreno, our other collaborator, Dr. Brian Jackson, and uh, my major professor, Dr. Brian Whipker. Um, we all form a fantastic team of collaborators. Um, some of these people have been involved on all the projects, others are collaborators on some projects, but research definitely does not take place in a vacuum. And as far as the uh, research process goes, we've been really blessed to have some amazing collaborators and uh, people in our lab. That's great. I mean, it really does take a team. And uh, I think it's important to recognize that when you see a name on a paper, that's not the full story of the work that went into it. So uh, thanks for highlighting that. Now, this paper itself, it's called Characterization of Nutrient Disorders of Cannabis Sativa. It was brought to my attention uh, recently. I mean, it's only was published in October 18th of 2019. Uh, do you want to give a quick highlight or sort of a, a rough idea of what the abstract was with this paper and what your goals were? Uh, when you first started doing this research? Yeah. So like I said, the first paper that we published um, was that general survey paper. Um, and that one is published. And that's meant to be kind of a, a shotgun approach to guidelines. You know, these were the ranges we saw in multiple different cultivars across different 
um, growing conditions. This one is trying to be a little more targeted and kind of um, narrow in on uh, optimal fertility recommendations for hemp and uh, trying to figure out what kind of fertility cannabis plants need in order to balance the nutrient cost input to growers and maximize the you know, uh, um, CBD content, flower content, depending on what you're growing for. So for this um, specific work, we were looking at nutrient deficiencies. So what that means is we were trying to stress the plants uh, down to a level where we could visually see symptoms of nutrient stress. And then we could take foliar uh, leaf tissue and send that off to a lab and compare that to plants that we grew with a complete fertility regime. And that complete fertility regime is based off of um, what's called a modified Hoagland solution. Um, it's a standard hydroponic um, water soluble nutrient fertilizer regime that basically balances all of the cations and anions and is supposed to provide a plant with everything that it needs as far as its macro and micronutrients are concerned. So we were trying to withhold an element from a plant from that recipe to induce our deficiency and then compare those visual symptoms and the leaf tissue analyses back to that plant. And that plant that received everything was our control. Now, are there is there research out there showing success uh, and, and growing with this Hoagland solution or formula uh, with cannabis? Or were you kind of going into a little bit of new territory with that in terms of making pulling from other crops? Yeah, so um, Dr. Whipker, myself, numerous other scientists have used the solution um, to provide fertility for a wide array of plants. So as far as specific to cannabis, um, no. Uh, we were the first to kind of pioneer a Hoagland solution with cannabis. But as far as the general literature is concerned, it has been... Um, tested on numerous different plants, numerous different crops, and proved to be adequate. Okay, so, and just out of curiosity, so as you started growing with this Togland solution as this baseline for fertility, uh, just anecdotally, you found that it seemed to be providing um, appropriate nutrient levels across the board for macro and micronutrients for, for cannabis? Correct, yes. And so um, kind of how the research logic goes is we took a broad survey approach. That was our first paper. And then we kind of wanted to see what would happen if we took away a singular nutrient from the plant and what that would do to the leaf tissue values compared to the survey that we had and what that would do to the you know, control plant that was receiving adequate fertility um, that has been proven to be adequate for multiple different crop species. Um, and then currently what we're doing, and I, I know we're getting off track a bit, but currently we are then modifying the Hoagland solution, the solution um, for all macro and micronutrients at different rates um, to try and get a, a foliar leaf tissue um, curve, if that makes sense. So from, you know, say like uh, zero parts per million to 2.5, so on and so forth to try and establish a curve. Um, for fertility as far as foliar analyses are concerned. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just kind of curious where you came up with this for, you know, a, a baseline for your control. Cause I think that's important for people to understand. Um, it, when, when you start talking about what you're removing, it's good to know where you were starting. That, that's all. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to get into a little bit of the methodology here, but just I had a couple things in the introduction that you guys mentioned in terms of relating back to prior work that had been done that I thought was kind of interesting. And I didn't know, maybe it's something you can touch on. Maybe it's just something that uh, pretty much the, the sentences that you put in there say at all, but I kind of wanted to bring them, bring them out. In hemp, fiber, in hemp fiber varieties, Bosca et al. reported higher levels of nitrogen, increased plant leaf weight, and decreased leaf THC content, presumably due to THC dilution. Can you touch on that at all? 
Yeah, so uh, that work in particular, like I said, once when I actually went into this and was doing the literature review and trying to get a good feel for the kind of research that had been done, um, there was not much out there. So this introduction is quite uh, bare bones when it comes to a normal introduction and literature review. Um, but essentially what we're trying to say there, um, and I think what the article was trying to get out is um, first, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this is a fiber variety. So we were growing a high CBD clone. Um, so the growth habit and growth parameters are a bit different for fiber varieties. You want them to be very tall. You're trying to get, you know, plant them very densely. They're in a field condition typically. Um, and the CBD varieties that we were growing, you know, you want those big, beautiful flowers. Uh, they're more compact. They were grown in a greenhouse. Um, but essentially, what we're um, what we're trying to get at here is to draw on previous work um, showing that nitrogen increased the total production of leaf biomass, and that's important when looking at leaf tissue analyses, um, you know, because you're comparing. Uh, how much nitrogen is in that leaf. And so a larger leaf, you know, you can potentially have a dilution effect. And also that increased plant size could have resulted in a THC dilution effect. So if you have a larger bud, but the same amount of THC in it, because uh, most things are calculated off of a percentage dry weight, you can have an artificially low dilution effect. Um, however, I am unsure I can't recall off the top of my head um, which methodology they actually used to test THC in this study, whether it was a percentage dry weight or a percentage concentration, so on and so forth. That could be really interesting for people in uh, growing hemp that are looking to stay below a given THC percentage um, in order to have a legal crop. Um, I'd be curious to see more research coming out on that around nitrogen levels. Yeah, I would too. Um, any research at this point is just going to help that additive scientific effect so that we can get a clearer picture for what's going on. Okay, so one thing, I, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was at the end of your introduction, you mentioned that no visual guides of nutrient deficiency in cannabis supported with leaf tissue analysis and documenting a progression of symptomology have been published. So essentially what you're saying there is when I go online on Google Images and type in you know, nitrogen deficiency, cannabis, or whatever particular element I'm looking for, there's no research that's been published that actually correlates that with a tissue test, a leaf tissue analysis to show that that truly is the deficiency. Is that correct? Along with symptomology. So different stages. Correct. As far as I know and have seen and was able to tease out in the work that I did, there have been some leaf tissue analyses reported. Um, I believe the Plant Analysis Handbook has some uh, tissue values for cannabis sativa. Uh, but as far as correlating those visual symptoms with an actual leaf tissue test, um, and what I mean by actually correlating, I don't mean just providing low fertility. When we ha um, withheld nitrogen from the plant, the plant received no nitrogen of any form. So we can say with relative certainty that the symptomology that we saw based on the leaf tissue analysis is truly nitrogen deficiency because the plant received absolutely no nitrogen fertility. Well, let's dive right into nitrogen. Um, I'm not going to get into too much into your methodology. It's all there in the paper if people want to read it. Um, it, it's, it seems fairly straightforward to me. Um, Let's just talk about what your findings were related to nitrogen. So traditionally, when you think of nitrogen deficiencies, you think of a yellowing on the lower leaves, the plant's putting more energy into its upper leaves, uh, lighter greening over all of the plant. Um, what, I mean, you have some actual photos here so people can see initial, intermediate, and advanced stages of nitrogen deficiencies. But can you talk a little about, about those findings related to nitrogen? Yeah, so... Exploring nutrient deficiencies um, is kind of a, a fun, um, I guess you could call it a bit of a, a puzzle 
um, certain elements within plants are mobile. And what that means is the plant has the ability to remove those from certain tissues and portions and translocate them to other portions of the plant. So for example, nitrogen is mobile. So what that means is when the plant is nitrogen stressed, it will draw nitrogen from those lower leaves, which is why we kind of, you know, drew upon the fact that the symptomology developed first on the lower portion of the plant. Um, and it will translate, locate that to the, you know, other portions of the plant that, you know, need that nitrogen. You know, for example, the meristematic region as it's developing new leaves and putting on um, new shoots. So, um, and like you said, typical symptomology of nitrogen deficiency is going to be that yellowing or paling specifically of the lower foliage. Um, other elements that we looked at, you know, are immobile, which means you're going to see symptomology on the newer um, leaves, shoots, uh, newer portions of the plant. Yeah, that's a really good point regarding mobile and immobile nutrients. Um, how related is that to the hydrology um, in terms of your watering habits? In terms yeah. of nutrient mobility or nutrients that are mobile? Yeah, so the the whole flow and dynamics and flux of nutrients within the plant is is much more complicated than we went into in this paper. Um, like I said, we're trying to get some more foundational knowledge out there. Um, but yes, so for example, um, some plants are tran uh, taken up by the plant uh, through a process called mass flow. And that's very much related to how much um, water essentially the roots can absorb into the plant and uh, get those nutrients in. Um, and then there's other ways that the plant can um, obtain nutrients, scavenge nutrients, et cetera. Um, so as far as for this study, um, all of the plants were on an automatic irrigation system and received the same amount of um, liquid at the same intervals throughout the day. Um, the only thing that changed was which nutrients we were supplying to those plants in that solution. Okay. And one of your, one of the things I want to point out before we dive too far into any one element or nutrient here is, um, in a traditional cannabis growing environment, you're going to see multiple symptoms. Typically it's not ever just a nitrogen deficiency or a phosphorus deficiency. It's usually related to your watering or your environment, your humidity, your temperature, your lighting intensity, uh, insect pressure. There's so many variables. So, um, I hope listeners will keep that in mind uh, when they're utilizing a guide like this, that it's not as simple as just picking out one of the photos and saying that looks the closest to like my plant. And so that's what's going on. You have to have a little more history um, into how that plant's being grown and what's going on in the room. But just wanted to throw yes. in that little caveat. So sorry, uh, getting back to it. When you talk about nitrogen, one of your findings was the plants grown in nitrogen deficient conditions produce 50% less biomass when compared to the control. I thought this was an interesting finding. I mean, it seems expected. If the plant doesn't have nitrogen, it's not going to be able to grow as, uh, as efficiently. But you didn't find that across all of the different elements that you were uh, testing with. So uh, is there anything in relation to nitrogen that you want to touch on uh, regarding that? Yeah. So um, we have done numerous nutrient deficiency studies um, with multiple different crops. And this trend of um, dry weights being variable in their statistical significance um, kind of holds true across most of those studies. A lot of it is just dependent upon the, um, the plant and how they uptake um, nutrients, how they utilize those nutrients, their growth habits. You know, you can imagine something that stays in a rosette form is going to have very different nutrient needs and utilizations than something that has a very upright and leggy growth habits. Um, but as far as nitrogen is concerned, um, we expected to see a statistical significance between no nitrogen and nitrogen supplied treatments, um, specifically because nitrogen is a macronutrient. Um, and what that means is the plants um, uses more nitrogen um, and other macronutrients in greater quantities than say the micronutrients. 
both macro and micro are still needed by the plants. Um, but as far as the amounts that they need, um, it needs much, much, much more nitrogen um, than say even phosphorus or potassium or calcium. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there was such a strong statistically significant decrease in plant uh, dry weight when compared to the um, control. Now, in this test, you you were just dealing with vegetative plants, correct? So you never really looked at cannabinoid content, THC percentage, any of those things. Is that correct? That is correct. The current work that we're doing we are looking at, like I said, the nutrient rates for all macro and micronutrients across the plant's different life stages. So the experiment that we are doing now, we're looking at leaf tissue nutrient concentrations in the vegetative state. We then again sample once we have um, turned off our lighting and initiated those shorter days to start flowering. Um, and we harvest at pre-flower, which is typically a week to two weeks after we shut our lights off. And then we're waiting until they go into full flower maturity, which we're targeting about eight weeks um, for full flower maturity. And then we're again sampling leaf tissue. So we're getting this nice, not only nutrient rate curve, but also total plant life cycle and how the nutrients are changing, accumulating, moving within the plant. Um, this isn't an uptake study or a translocation study. It's a nutrient rate study over time. Um, but like I said, there's this additive effect. So that's kind of the next step that we're going on to, um, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that'll be really interesting because um, it, it's, it's fairly easy, I think, to grow a, a healthy vegetative cannabis plant. But as you get further into flower, as the plant starts senescing, uh, you st any particular stress, I think, becomes much, much more apparent. So even though as we move through some of these elements in your in your study here, and you said you, you note that there isn't uh, statistical significance in biomass, I think as we move into flower, uh, that'll become a lot more apparent in terms of the those deficiencies reflecting either uh, a loss of uh, THC or cannabinoid percentages um, or terpene values or even overall yield of, of flower biomass. So I'm really excited to see that work as you guys uh, come out with it. Yeah. And kind of going back to what you were saying with the uh, statistically not uh, the statistical non-significance in the plant dry weights. Um, so for example, for phosphorus, while we did not see a statistical significance in dry weight between the uh, plants that did not receive phosphorus versus the plants that did, um, you can look at the leaf tissue values and see that they were statistically significant, very statistically significant actually. So even though that phosphorus treatment may not have produced a smaller plant per se, it definitely had less phosphorus, which means that it will be stressed and won't be as healthy and consequently could potentially produce, you know, a bud that would be suboptimal. Sure, that makes sense. And, you know, I'm of the opinion that most, most growers over apply phosphorus in flower. Um, I'd be curious, are you going to look at what, uh, sort of what uh, sufficient sea levels are, are needed for phosphorus in flower versus uh, the overabundance that I, I think is applied throughout the cannabis industry um, in general when it comes to phosphorus. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we'll be looking at is when we take that final leaf tissue harvest. So we're going to be looking at, okay, at the end of the plant's life, how much phosphorus did it accumulate? Um, over these different rates, but then we will also be looking at um, cannabinoids, cannabinoids, however you want to say it, um, and how that can potentially relate back to the um, different rates that we're applying. So for example, in our phosphorus provided at, let's say hypothetically, 10 parts per million, um, what would that bud total dry mass be, but then what would also be 
the um, you know level of THC or CBD um, or CBG in that flower. Very cool. I can't wait to see that research. That's I think really exciting. Um, I would love to have you back on once you have you know gotten a little further along and publish that. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to do that. Cool. So let's let's move on to calcium. It looks like that's the next nutrient that you talk about here. Uh, I did notice that you put in dolomite lime into your substrate to get some calcium and magnesium in there. Uh, can you can you touch on that and then also what your findings were with calcium? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the um, rooting substrate that we use, because these were vegetative cuttings, yes, some of that did have dolomitic lime um, amended in it, um, but those levels would be negligible on the scale that we're um, looking at, especially as the plants continue to grow and there's you know more biomass and consequently less calcium. Um, and you can see that in the statistically significant results from the leaf tissue concentration that we saw. Um, but as far as symptomology for calcium goes, um, calcium is an immobile element. So when you're looking to see calcium stress or deficiency on your plants, you're going to be looking at the growing tips, the newly expanded leaves, the portions of the plants that are actively growing and expanding. Um, so calcium, the plant isn't able to requisition any calcium reserves from old cells or old plant parts and translocate it. So that's why you're looking at these new portions. Um, and another thing with calcium is that it's involved in um, cell wall stability and um, uh, basically um, what happens when a plant goes through a calcium deficiency is it cannot adequately develop. So you'll see this severe distortion and stunting um, that we saw and you can see in the photos as they progress. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we were able to see such beautiful, um, <laughs> I say beautiful, but if you're seeing the symptomology, it's not beautiful when it grow up, <laughs> um, but beautiful symptomology um, that we induced. Yeah, it's quite dramatic. It's it's very apparent, uh, which I think is is what you're referring to there. And it is great to see, and you can see it. It just it almost looks like uh, it had a lot of light stress. I think in a lot of ways, um, it's it's. I was quite shocked with just how dramatic it is because it's funny because in the uh, in the cannabis industry, there's sort of this old mantra that if your plant looks uh, at all sick or deficient, you just apply CalMeg. And it's kind of become a running joke in the cannabis industry of just, you know, put more cow mag on that product. But in reality, I think uh, it's rare we see these sorts of calcium deficiencies that they do occur. Um, at least I don't see them as much with the growers that I work with. I tend to see more nitrogen or potassium deficiencies. But um, yeah, I, I really liked seeing those photos. So that, that was really great to see. Um, was there anything else about calcium that you wanted to add? I love that you're kind of describing a little bit of how these nutrients work in a plant. Cause I think that's really important. So I, I appreciate that too. Um, what, if, if you're okay with it, let's move on to sulfur and you can talk a little bit about that too. Yeah. Um, I'd like to touch on one more thing on calcium real quick. Um, okay. so calcium and boron will have very similar symptomology and they're both immobile elements, but, um, one of the reasons, um, and we have completed the micronutrients um, experiment run for that nutrient rates by life cycle portion. So I can talk a little bit about some of the symptomology and results, um, not true results yet. We haven't run statistics on the full study, um, but because cannabis, um, once it initiates its reproductive phase, that growing tip will become the flowering portion um, calcium and boron are extremely important in that development because, you know, when they finally are, um, initiate the reproductive cycle and start producing that flower bud, it's going to be at that growing tip that you see across the plant. So if you do have calcium or boron deficiencies, you will not have a properly developing flower bud because you won't have a properly developing and expanding growing region. And so, you know, we saw that with our boron plants, you know, our, we had almost no flowers produced um, on our boron zero rate 
um, once we initiated flowering, just because there were, the plant was physiologically incapable of expanding and growing because it did not have the structural components needed to build those cells and expand those cells. That's really interesting. And people can go and view these photos to see what, uh, what Paul's describing here on, uh, on the paper itself. There's some great photos associated with every one of these elements. Yeah. So, um, you wanted to move on to sulfur next, is that correct? Yeah. We'll just keep working our way through. I think this is great. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. So for sulfur, um, again, it was one of those elements where we did not see a statistically significant difference in the dry weight between the plants that did not receive any sulfur versus the control. However, when you actually look at the leaf tissue concentration, um, it was statistically significant. Um, so the plants that received no sulfur had much, much lower leaf tissue concentrations than plants that um, received an adequate um, level of sulfur fertility. And again, I want to kind of go back to what you said a bit earlier on, um, you know, making sure that you take a holistic approach to diagnostics in your plants. You know, I, um, that was great that you said that. Leaf tissue analysis is just one way of trying to tease out problems that you may experience. You know, it's like you said, it's this holistic approach that you have to take. It could be another abiotic stress, you know, it could be ozone damage, it could be water stress, you know. So taking those leaf tissue concentrations from your plant, actually going in, taking the leaf tissue sample, sending it off to a lab, um, ensuring that you can do that and that the lab is licensed and that the laws and legalities in your state allow you to do that. To gain this information will be extremely valuable if you think you have a nutrient deficiency. You always want to go that extra step if possible and check to ensure that what you're seeing visually is also reflected in the plant. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, topic because, because cannabis is federally illegal, we cannot ship any leaf samples, even if they're of a vegetative plant with zero THC content um, in the mail. So most cannabis facilities are very limited in their ability to do tissue testing. Uh, so a lot of what we do is soil testing because um, we're primarily working with organic soil growers uh, where we where we have uh, certain levels of, of mineral content in every soil mix that we're working with in, or native soil. And then it's just a matter of trying to balance those based off of like a Malik three test, which is not ideal. Uh, I'm fully aware of that, but it's one of the limit limitations within uh, the cannabis research, at least uh, from a facility perspective, because we are limited not only just in um, the ability to mail leaf samples to reach a lab, to even find a lab that's willing to look at a cannabis sample. And then also just the cost associated with testing for businesses is, is uh, really tough. So it, it's great that the university is doing work like this to at least allow uh, growers to have access to some of this information. Yeah, that's, that's a great insight. Um, and again, you know, we're, we're learning as much as we possibly can. So Honestly, the exchanges that we get with growers and the kind of challenges that they're experiencing, it only helps us do better research. So who knows, maybe down the road, we're going to uh, look at possibly correlating some of, you know, the nutrient work that we're doing to, you know, some of those soil tests. Um, I know that there's researchers out there who do a lot of work with that, and uh, I think they jump at the opportunity um, to do some work like that if it's needed. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'd love to see more correlation there between like the Malik 3 and saturated paste tests with these tissue tests so we can have a better idea of how we're uh, of nutrient availability in these soils. Because the other challenge there too is how much of those those nutrients are really available to a plant and, and how well is the biology at cycling those nutrients. So if we're talking about organic systems, there's so many variables involved that it gets quite complex and uh I think it's going to be a long time before we have all those answers, but um, by using, you know, 
chemical nutrients or mineral salts like you guys are, you're really able to isolate out these various uh, minerals or nutrients, which really makes a difference in, in seeing these, these symptoms so that we can, we can still apply some of this knowledge towards, you know, our more complex organic soil systems. Yeah, I definitely agree. The one thing I will say with sulfur that I see is I tend to see it in very high levels in organic soils, primarily because people either applying sulfates or gypsum as a way of mitigating the alkalinity of a lot of the cations in, um, in soils. So I tend to see like excessively high sulfur levels. However, from all the research I found, it's very hard to reach sulfur toxicities in soils or more specifically in cannabis plants um, to where I haven't really seen it be a big issue. It's been one of the best tools for lowering pH um, that I've found in soils. Is there anything you want to, you would touch on regarding that comment? Um, yeah, it's very difficult to um, produce a sulfur toxicity. Um, and without going too much into the details and physiology of that, um, essentially the plant is very good at requisitioning, utilizing, or um, excluding sulfur within the soil. Um, one thing that you can see and uh, some things that have come out of literature is that um, elevated sulfur levels, just like any other element being elevated above others in the soil profile can potentially impact, um, and I, I will call, qualify that by saying can potentially impact um, the microbial community, and especially in say an organic system like what you're working with, um, you know, looking at how those microbes can take those nutrients and turn them into, you know, a mineralized for, uh, form that is plant available. You know, that relationship between the organic matter, the microbes, and then the production of those mineral plant available forms is a very important network and web to uh, be maintaining and monitoring. So down the road, maybe there could be uh, more work done specifically with regard to uh, microbes and say elevated sulfur levels and uh, nutrient cycling and organic systems. Yeah, it was really what I would like to see regarding sulfur is information on how sulfur impacts soil biology. Because when we talk about sulfur, uh, it, it comes in a lot of different forms. So when we talk about a sulfate form where it's, you know, we talk about potassium sulfate, um, calcium sulfate in the case of gypsum, uh, it appears to have, uh, and this is anecdotal, very uh, little minor impact on overall soil biology and nutrient cycling. But I've heard when using agricultural sulfur, which is associated with lowering pH, uh, it can have a more dramatic input impact on soil biology. But I haven't, I haven't seen enough research and it, I haven't seen enough data to really show how much sulfur would need to be added to lower a pH level this much in a given volume of soil and how that impacts so about those are things that I would love answers to down the road or if that research exists someone send it to me because I haven't seen it yeah some research like that would be fantastic um, especially with regards to um, organic forms of sulfur um, there's like you said there's definitely very much need for um, more information to help perpetuate that additive scientific uh, process Okay, but let's go back and, and why don't you tell us a little bit more about magnesium? I know I got off topic there for a second. Yeah, so magnesium deficiency. Um, magnesium is involved with um, chlorophyll and essentially what a plant will, when a plant experiences magnesium deficiency, chlorophyll essentially doesn't function in the way that it's supposed to. And um, what that means for the plant is if you have a magnesium deficiency, the photosynthetic activity of the plant could be much lower. And that will impact the uh, resources and the photosynthates that the plant has and is able to then throw at the developing bud um, and other developing portions of the plant. Um, so if you think about it in a typical life cycle, um, you know, every organism wants to reproduce. And especially in plants, as you touched on, um, a lot of times with the reproductive stage of the plant, you'll experience 
much more pronounced stressors, and that will be when you start seeing those symptomologies for nutrient deficiencies or for, you know other stresses that the plant may be experiencing because it's dumping so many of those resources into that developing flower bud with the end goal of trying to reproduce. Um, and so especially mag um, magnesium, um, you can potentially have huge impacts to your yield. And again, like I said, we have not explored the full rates and life cycle analysis yet of this um, element throughout the plant. Um, but it, it's one of those that you want to keep a specific eye on given its importance to plant health overall. And um, then also touching on the, the symptomology by location um, on the leaf and how it develops and progresses. Um, like you said, they're very similar. Magnesium and potassium deficiency symptomologies are very similar. And so understanding that leaf anatomy and how it progresses, you know, is, is important in the visual diagnostic checklist um, that you kind of go through. And obviously, um, in an ideal world, we would um, identify a nutrient deficiency early before it gets to these advanced stages um, so that, you know, we don't have to wait until it, we see advanced symptomology to determine, you know, magnesium versus potassium deficiency. Yeah, now I'm excited to talk about potassium because I think potassium is one of the most important elements when we're talking about cannabis. And I don't have the data to support this yet, at least, um, I, I mean, I have, you know, hundreds of soil tests I've looked at rel relating to overall plant growth, but they're not, um, I haven't had any plant tissue analysis. But the trend that I think I'm seeing is that uh, potassium deficiencies occur at a much higher rate in cannabis as in they need more potassium than uh, most agricultural crops and i think potassium has a high correlation with uh, bud density and overall uh, weight so essentially talking yield um, based on the soil tests that i see correlating with plants so plants that appear to be or soils that appear to be k deficient um, or even just case sufficient, like barely sufficient, tend to produce lower yield and uh, lower weight, yeah, lower weight and overall lower yield and lower bud density than these, than plants that have uh, what most would consider an excess of potassium. But I'd be curious to have you talk on it um, and also talk about what your findings were with potassium in this particular uh, paper. Yeah, so the interesting thing about potassium, um, especially with regards to, um, say, a soil profile, as opposed to um, some of the, you know, soluble fertilizers that we were using here, is it's a uh, monovalent ion, which means its charge is, um, it, it essentially has a charge, a positive charge, a singular positive charge. Um, so typically what happens, um, say you have a heavy rain event, those monovalent ions will be leached through the soil profile more readily than, say, your divalent. And so that means that potassium can move into a plant um, relatively easily, um, but it also moves through the soil profile relatively easily as well. Um, but uh, that's kind of a side note. And as far as the research findings that we found, um, we also found that you know limiting potassium had a huge impact on the um, the obviously it had an impact on how much potassium was uptake uh, was taken into the plant because there was none supplied. But once it was supplied, the potassium levels were quite high um, in the plant. And uh, we referenced our survey values um, in the paper as well. Um, and those were within the uh, reference values that we had in our initial study. Um, but I would agree with you that more work definitely needs to be done in potassium. Um, as far as its role in bud development um, and et cetera, as you touched upon, um, I, I'm uncomfortable 
addressing that given you know we have not yet explored the potassium rates in the life cycle um, but once we do um, that's definitely something that I will be specifically looking for um, and comparing in our study so that's extremely helpful well, I can't wait to see that because what I so I'll, I'll get from a grower a malic 3 test for example at the beginning of the growth cycle and then one at the end and what I find is uh, in terms of how far the nutrients have dropped in the soil, you know, nitrogen and potassium are the two that see, that uh, all, typically appear to drop the most. And as you mentioned, they are very mobile. They could be being leached out of the soil from a flooding event. But a lot of the guys that we're working with too are using um, blue mats, which are essentially an automated watering system that only waters as that soil dries out. So it's it's controlled through osmotic pressure. Uh, by the soil itself. And so we tend to not have a lot of leaching going on through that bed. So in theory, if nothing's leaching out the bottom of the bed, then that, that potassium is being taken up into the plant. And as we see potassium levels drop to, let's say, around 5% or lower of the total uh, cation exchange CEC of the, of the, total, uh, the total plant, or, or sorry, total of what's available in the soil, I, I start to see smaller buds, lower yield, that sort of thing. So I'd, I'd love to see research on that and see what really is going on there um, in the leaf tissue itself. That's actually really interesting. I'll have to keep that in mind when looking at the study when uh, we run the macronutrients. Like I said, we ran the micronutrients. We have yet to run the macronutrients. So I'd love to talk more with you just off air um uh, about that that's actually very fascinating um especially if they're using a blue mat system um that could potentially mean um well we, we can talk later we can we can speculate about that later i appreciate you hearing me out so let's <laughs> let's move on to your micronutrient disorders because you uh you had some interesting stuff going on there too yeah um so like i said one of the the nutrients that I'd like to specifically highlight would be um, boron. Um, and again, that is involved in the um, essentially cell wall development and stabilization. And so especially if you experience a boron deficiency um, and then you're uh, close to your initiation of reproduction and you don't remedy that, um, like I said, one thing that we saw is we had little to no flower bud formation due to the fact that meristematic region was not able to uh, properly develop and expand into the developing flower bud. And as far as, um, I guess we can talk about copper. Was there a specific one that you wanted to address? No, I think what you're, you're, the overview you're giving is great. I will just caution listeners that when we're talking about these micronutrients, we're talking about very, very small amounts, typically parts per million. Um, you don't need a lot of boron for a plant to be sufficient. So, I, you know, don't go out there and buy borax and apply a bunch to your soil and think you're fixing a deficiency because you'll probably kill your plant. Uh, I just want to highlight that for people. When we, we talk about micronutrients, we're talking about typically pretty small levels of nutrient that's actually needed. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point. And um, to add to that, um, in this experiment, we added a boron toxicity treatment. So essentially what we did is we took that modified Hoagland solution, we took the boron levels and we increased them tenfold of what the Hoagland solution um, requires. And we did that um, with manganese as well. And the reason we do that is because we often see, um, like you said, it's very easy to overapply a micronutrient. So we also wanted to try and cat uh, capture some of those toxicity symptomologies because not every nutrient uh, issue that you run into will be a deficiency. Sometimes you're overapplying something or something is too available or the plant is taking up too much of something or you know another element may be in such high quantities that it's causing another element to be plant unavailable. Yeah, and it's what's interesting. I'm looking through these photos right now. A boron initial boron toxicity looks almost exactly like your initial potassium deficiency. They're very close. Um, Correct. And I think that's interesting for people because I've seen people walk into a grow room, look at a plant and immediately say, Oh, that's nitrogen. Oh, that's potassium. Oh, whatever. 
And that always makes me nervous. Um, because there are, there's so many variables associated with this. I mean, a lot of, especially in soils, uh, a lot of your nutrient deficiencies and excesses can be related to hydrology or the way that you're watering. By just underwatering your plant, you can cause a lot of nutrient deficiencies because the microbes aren't able to cycle nutrients effectively uh, due to a lack of water. So, or, or due to lack of osmotic pressure, move those nutrients throughout the plant. So I think that's really important to highlight um, I just want to point that out while we're, while we're on the topic. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. I find one of the most helpful things you can ask any grower of any crop is first and foremost for a crop history, because most of the times uh, you're seeing something that is an issue that was created sometime in the past that is now manifesting. And so um, yeah, that's a fantastic point. Um, and I'm glad to see that there's other people out there who are, you know, stopping and thinking and taking a more holistic approach to, you know, diagnosing issues. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on regarding uh, the manganese or boron toxicities that you saw or either of those elements in general in relation to plant growth or plant health? Yeah, um, one thing I will say is um, when looking at toxicities, and you can see this in the photos, and I, I hope that this photo also gets posted so that uh, listeners can reference it, um, you will often see that toxicity symptomology, um, regardless of element, follows a very specific progression where you see that you know, marginal chlorosis. So that yellowing of the margin first. Um, and then it will progress to the marginal necrosis, which is that burning or that um, the browning of the leaf margin. And you'll see that, uh, and you can see that in you know the, the comparison image that we have between manganese toxicity and boron toxicity. You know that the marginal symptomology is very pronounced in almost any toxicity. So just kind of as a side note, you know, being careful and cautious when, you know, dealing with the leaf margin, um, especially if it's going chlorotic or um, necrotic. Yeah, that's, that's excellent advice. I, I, that wasn't something I was aware of or had really ever thought of, honestly, when I think of toxicities. So I, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. Did you want to touch on, uh, did you want to move on to uh, your, what looks like iron and zinc were the next two on the, in your paper? Yeah. Um, we can move on to iron. So, um, again, as I stated, um, magnesium toxicity or magnesium deficiency, manganese deficiency, iron deficiency, they all kind of have this intervenal chlorosis symptom, um, symptoms that develop on the foliage. And so, um, you know, doing work like this, you, we're trying as best we can to develop these uh, criterias and checklists, both visually and with leaf tissue to help people diagnose things. But a lot of times the symptomologies are very similar. So being careful that um, when you're looking at these, that you're taking, again, a holistic approach and um, trying to utilize the tools that are available to you to help diagnose these. Um, but yeah, iron deficiency um, again, you'll get this severe intervenal chlorosis in those more advanced symptoms. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can identify and remedy iron before it gets to this level. Um, but letting the plants go out this far, that's one of the reasons that we allowed, you know, the plants to grow in these deficient conditions for so long so that we'd have that gradient of beginning, intermediate, and advanced symptomology. Um, and, uh, as far as iron is concerned, it is another immobile element. So for this particular element, if you're seeing symptomology on the new expanding leaves, the growing portions, the plants, that, the portions of the plant that are actively growing, this is where you're going to be seeing that, you know, intervenal chlorosis. And so looking at where on the plant these symptoms are occurring will help you identify and, you know, kind of utilize that as a checklist, you know, is this iron or is this, you know, a mobile element? Um, and there's some wonderful charts online that you all can utilize. Um, if you just look at um, nutrient mobility in plants, it will tell you which, um, there's some charts out there that have, you know, categorize mobile elements versus immobile elements um, and will help you 
identify more. Uh, it's, it's a tool, a diagnostic tool that you can utilize um, to figure out which uh, element you may be experiencing, which nutrient may be limiting in your uh, fertility regime. That's great. Yeah, I think you covered it. Um, anything you want to touch on regarding zinc or I see you mentioned even molybdenum. I have done zero work on molybdenum. I really don't know much about it overall. Um, is there anything you want to share in particular relating to either of those? Yeah. Um, we utilized molybdenum because it is a plant essential micronutrient. Um, but as far as plants that often display symptomology and molybdenum deficiency, um, it, it's kind of hit or miss. Most of the time, molybdenum is more important for um, nodulating plants. Um, so plants that will uh, form uh, associations with bacteria to form uh, root nodules to fix atmospheric nitrogen, um, such as your legumes. Um, but for example, poinsettias, poinsettias will often display molybdenum deficiency. So it was kind of hit or miss. We kind of threw it in just for fun to kind of see what would happen. Um, but like I said, um, and you can look at the, uh, the composite picture, not much symptomology occurred. Um, and we did not have uh, statistically uh, significant differences in dry weights, uh, even though we did receive a statistically significant difference in leaf tissue concentration of molybdenum. So basically there was more molybdenum in the leaf tissue in your treatment versus the control. However, that didn't display visually and, or in terms of your overall biomass when you measured the two plants. Um, it sounds like from what I'm, from what I'm getting. Uh, one thing I will say is because we use, you know, kelp, Things like kelp meal and rock dust, I have never really worried about molybdenum. I figure we're picking some up through those because they contain some of those elements. But I'll be curious to see as you move through flower, looking at molybdenum, if you start to see statistically significant differences in overall yield or cannabinoid content. Um, that, that might be interesting because I'd like to maybe start playing around with the addition of molybdenum to see if it makes um, has real, any real growth impact or plant health impact. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, definitely something that we'll be looking at uh, with regard to um, our statistical analysis on the micronutrient study that we just completed, the rate over life cycle experiment. Um, that all, um, all of these micronutrients, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens yeah. with the different rates over the, uh, the life cycle of the plant. Cool. Well, I think you covered all my questions. I know we, there's some of the discussion uh, explains some of your findings, which really fits with a lot. I think we already covered most of that just in our discussion of the elements. But was there anything else you wanted to add regarding this research uh, before we sign off? Yeah, um, just again to reiterate that one of the most valuable things you can do whenever you're looking at a problem is utilizing the tools that you have available to you, you know, looking at what you did in the past to try and figure out, you know, is, for example, you used water. Am, am I providing enough water? And is that causing a nutrient issue de facto? Or, you know, did I apply something that may now be in, interacting in a negative effect in the soil profile and causing another element to be uh, plant unavailable? Um, and again, this, this work, we're, we're still in a process. We're learning, we're producing science. It's an additive process. So this is, you know, visual symptomology is correlated to leaf tissue. Um, and, you know, these, these pictures are very helpful and useful. But again, some of the symptomology is similar. So looking at, you know, the progression of the symptomology, um, comparing that to the pictures, and then also looking at where on the plant, those symptoms are occurring will be extremely useful. Yeah, well, I look forward to seeing further research out of your university and, and you personally, and 
I'm really grateful for your time today and I, I look forward to staying in touch and hopefully we'll get to have you or someone, one of your colleagues back on soon to talk about some of the latest research and some of your findings. Absolutely. Yeah, we're definitely very excited for a lot of the research we're doing and uh, definitely even more excited to continue talking with growers and uh, producers to, uh, you know, understand the needs that they have as far as research is concerned. Um, it's very much a two way street, uh, what the industry needs and does and the issues that they're experiencing help us do better research that's more applicable and helps the industry as a whole. So this bilateral exchange is uh, uh, extremely important and definitely is something that needs to continue in uh, greater quantity for all researchers that are gonna be doing work in hemp or cannabis. That was Paul Coxon, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget to check out our website at www.kisorganics.com for more information and resources and links to topics we discussed on the show today. Please sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage so you can stay up to date while you're there, and give us a follow on Instagram at kisorganics. Thanks for listening.